Welcome back to Real Cast Fishing. Your host, Glenn, with the City of Allen Fishing Fuel Team, the COH Fuel Team on YouTube. And this round, what have we got for you? Well, this is the Fishing Ramblings for a series of our podcast. And this round, I just want to give you some quick updates or fishing updates from some recent happenings that we've been working through, uh, especially with all these rains that we've had in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. I know, uh, well, yours truly has been. Uh, sidetracked with all that rain but i did get a chance to get out there last weekend with some jug line fishing and that was a a a pretty good round of fishing for yours truly uh additionally during that time because there's a lot of rain and whatnot uh there are a lot of things you can do indoors uh that you can do that are still fishing related so in particular we did several demos on amazon and we went ahead and rebroadcast them back onto the YouTube channel. And some of the things that we were talking about was using the dubbing loop tool, uh, nail knot tying tool, and also the whip finish tool, which you also do a DIY version of it. And then additionally, uh, also showed some demos on the foam cutter that yours truly was using to uh, make a couple of flies and that follow with some quick tie fly tying videos. So I'll talk about that. And then we'll shift over to, oh, tandem rig flies. I've got a little demo going on tomorrow uh, evening to go over some tandem rig fishing flies. That may be some interest for some folks. So with that, <clears throat> let's go ahead and begin. We'll start out with the first topic, jug line fishing. I hope some of y'all have been able to get out there uh, in, our, in your local lakes and whatnot. And if you've never tried jug line fishing, I'd say give it a try. Uh, some of the things that I've learned, especially with the uh, kayak that I use, is the easier it is to get up and start to get loaded and to the lake, uh, the more likely you'll be able to, to, to use it more often. And other than the rain, uh, I've been sidetracked with that. I normally would be hitting the lake at least once a week, if not more. And in uh, this round... The first kayak fishing trip was uh, I decided to go with some jug lines. Uh, some key takeaways out of that is the shatter at the boat ramps. Uh, you can pretty much get the boat bait you need uh, at the boat ramps. Just get yourself a cast net. I was just using a little three-foot version that I use for kayak fishing. It's a smaller one that I can keep compact and put in my kayak as well as still carry it and, uh, instead of um leaving it in my little pickup. So with that said, uh, I, I do have a larger size cast net that uh, I find is what I use when I'm, I'm really stacking up for some bait, but for these short trips or quick trips, uh, just good to have that little three footer in there ready to go catch a few and then be out on the lake or out on the water fairly quickly. Uh, so the shad are at boat ramps, at least in our area. This is the North Texas, Allen, Texas, just North of Dallas, Fort Worth, or Dallas. Um, let's see some other thing that I tried a trolling bait bucket. Uh, I've had one in the past, used it for some weight fishing on the coast to uh, keep some of my shrimp and other bait fish uh, alive uh, as I wade fished the uh, the coast. Uh, but I decided to go ahead and try it for some kayak fishing, and it does work well. You can. Put your bait in there, troll it behind you, and there's no issue with, um, well, keeping the bait alive. They, they stay alive a lot longer than if you did with a bait bucket in the, uh, the your boat or kayak. But in my case, uh, I went ahead, at least that round, just put the bait bucket in the kayak because I was using it, um, well, using the shad for, for basically dead bait. So uh, the other thing is, uh, let's see... Do be aware of changes in weather and whatnot. Let's see, Maxwell the cat. Yo, all right. Hi, hi, Maxwell the cat. Just talking some fishing updates, uh, fishing ramblings and fishing in general. And I just was mentioning the uh, jug line fishing and whatnot. I was going to troll you, but you still, but you chill. <laughs> all right, cool. Thanks. Let's see. Hope you have a good day. All right, take care. Uh, let's see. So with that said, um, smaller or beware of the rains and whatnot that have been hitting our area. Uh, sometimes at least today there was 
no forecasted rain and whatnot, or at least thunderstorms. And sure enough, we got hit by a bunch. So be careful on the water. Make sure you have your good gear and whatnot. All right. All right. Like a really good day. All right. Take care. Going to try out the jug line on Broken Bow Lake. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay, Bob. Hi, Bob. Sure. Um, what, I, what I've been doing, at least with these self-setting jug lines, is I pre-bait them in groups of three. And once I get them loaded, I'll uh, uh, get them get them deployed fairly quickly. And uh, hi, <laughs> all right, hi Bob. Okay, um, other things kayak fishing wise, I am trying to get back out on the lake, but this time I was going to do some trolling. Um, in particular, doing some of the sabiki rig slab and jig rigs that I like using, and I kind of flip flop between the two between. Uh, doing the slab and jig rigs. And if I'm working a particular area and the fish are deeper, I'll just shift to bottom bouncing. So I'll use that same setup, but I'll just bounce the bottom. If I'm getting into a really sh- rocky or brushy area with lots of snags, then I'll shift over and replace the the uh, slab with either a small bank sinker or uh, another maybe a heavier crappie jig. Uh, with that light wire so if i do get hung up i'm able to just pull free and and straighten the hook and i'm able to maintain or at least save my rig Uh, so that's what i'm trying to plan for for the next kayak fishing trip Uh, more to come there once the rain's clear i think i should be able to get there at least in the next week here so stay tuned for that one and i'll definitely get a video out as to how good or bad it went and then uh, uh other things fishing update wise just mentioned that I've been working on a bunch of different demo videos on Amazon, and I'm rebroadcasting them back out to uh, YouTube. Uh, several ones that I, I uh, posted recently was using a dubbing loop tool to make the dubbing fly, dubbing tool fly. This is one that works really well on bluegill, especially when they're on beds, and they just don't want to strike uh, on the surface and they just want something that's going through their beds and whatnot um then really well with that the dubbing tool fly and that dubbing loop uh the other thing was i did one on a nail knot tying tool and the main takeaway there with that nail knot tying tool is just some some rehashing of how i use that tool a lot of times i mainly use it for making that initial loop to loop connection when there is a fly line that i'm using that has no loop uh to get that loop-to-loop connection from your fly line to your leader. Uh, what I like doing, instead of tying a nail knot, every time I put on new leader and snipping part of my fly line, instead I'll just take a 30-pound uh, Stren Mono and use that nail knot tying tool to secure that Mono to the end of the fly line, and then I'll use a perfection loop. And then at that point, the only thing I'm doing is putting on a new uh, leader and I'm keeping that um, mono section that's been nail knot tied to the fly line. And I find that that works really well. Additionally, I'll shift it off and use a high vis fluorescent orange or yellow or chartreuse uh, Dacron backing as, as that uh, in, in place of the mono. And what happens there is uh, you can apply some silicone dry fly float into the the Dacron piece. And at that point, you can use that as a sight indicator, so more like a strike indicator. It floats on the water still, and you can still see it from a good ways out. And when those uh, fish are kind of spooky, having that strike indicator or line sight indicator works out well. And with that nail knot tying tool, it's been a, a, um, a much easier to put a, a put that rig together. The, the other demo that I posted was a whip finish tool, how to use it, also how to do a whip finish with your fingers alone. Uh, that works out well. But then I also showed how you do a DIY version of it. So you can make one that's bigger, uh, has a wider gap. And what happens there is, is if you're tying foam spiders, grasshoppers, whatnot, or you secure the final tie about mid-body or just forward of mid-body and you have all those wings as well as legs and whatnot that'll be clobbering your your ability to complete that whip finish 
making your own do-it-yourself wood finish tool with that wider gap makes uh, makes it much easier. So do take a look at that one. That's that's done really well both on YouTube and Amazon. Uh, let's see. The other demo I was showing was the foam cutters. This is um one from River Creations. And I picked up three of them way back, and I've used them ever since. Um, initially, I was just making or shaping them um, manually, freehanding it basically with a scissor. Uh, and then I got those foam cutters, and I just kind of just stamp them out. And I got the foam damselfly. Uh, I've got a caddis pattern that works really well to make these little foam spiders and mini foam grasshoppers, as well as the the, the classic beaver tail hopper. Um, all three of those are, are really well, and uh, those demos have, have done well. Um, have some folks been checking it out, and I, I've heard from other folks that they've done really well with that same foam cutter. I mean, some folks that I believe have had um, pretty much um, had them for, for many years, and I've had mine for over 10 years with no issue. They're still sharp, and I've got a lifetime supply of foam bodies now for whatever fly I'm putting together. That's going to use that particular body. Uh, let's see. Other than that, um, anyone have any questions, comments, anything they want to throw out? Uh, this is like a fishing ramblings portion of the podcast. So it's really Q&A comments and just talking fishing. I know it's been tough up here with the uh, with all the rains and whatnot, but I, I've been paying attention to different folks fishing and Looks like the bite's still out there. Uh, I did one Q and A, like impromptu one that looked at uh, Dennis and Dam Tail Race at Texoma, just talking to some some tips there, or some suggestions there. So I put that out there. Uh, I think uh, several weeks ago or or so. Uh, I did notice when I looked at the hydropower uh, schedule that it looked like they closed the gates, so they're not releasing, but they are working really well. Uh, with their generation schedule. Bottom bouncing for stand bass. Can you explain how this works? Sure, sure, sure. Um, I've got several videos on it, um, but I'll, I'll try to explain it. What you do is you'll take your, your fishing pole. I typically use a seven foot ugly stick as well as those Zemco floating ones. They, they float, the handle still floats in the water and whatnot, even when you drop it over, overboard. And what I do is I'll use a, a standard slab and jig rig. So the slab will be on the bottom and the jig will be 18 inches plus. Sometimes I'll go with two or three more jigs um, and I'll have them all tandem rigged. And what you do is you cast and you let the slab hit bottom and then you start back paddling. And what happens is you you want to see your your rod tip kind of do this steady twitchy motion all right like this when you're doing it right when you're back paddling with your kayak and you'll see that that twitchy motion uh will become a steady rhythm you can you kind of sense that that's just the bottom that you're bouncing and then two things will happen you'll either get a hit and you'll see the the, the rod tip uh uh, drastically uh, additionally you may even have a smaller one hit and immediately another one will hit and you've loaded up on the on the uh, on the slab and jig rigs that you're you're bottom bouncing uh, that's pretty much it uh, the main thing that I'll do is depending on the lake um, I'll work a particular shoreline and just kind of work back and forth and uh, First, I'll initially try trolling the area, just a traditional troll where it's behind, where the line or the uh, rig's behind me, just trying to locate the the fish. Uh, if I do have my depth finder or fish finder and I find some brushy area, then I'll actually work my way back paddling, uh, bottom bouncing the uh, uh, slab and jig ring on the bottom. And again, just watch for that, that strike as it's just bouncing the surface. And just to give you a, a backstory on how I learned how to do that, that was by accident. Um, I was fishing Clear Lake Park over there at Lake Levon, and I'd been just trolling a good two, three hours with maybe one or two hits, and it was brutal. Um, got a good workout, but yeah, 
Uh, it was not the numbers that I was normally used to. And then uh, I decided to go and fish the bank and I put my kayak on the shore and I forgot that I had my uh, one of my rods with a with two crappie jigs uh, tandem rig and I forgot that I had them there uh, and what happened is is because the current the way it was blowing and everything was going uh, the that set of jigs were still on the bottom and just kind of bouncing bottom and dragging even though um uh i was still uh the kayak was uh, on 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 the shore and i went back and i checked it and lo and behold i i caught a i caught a fish and then i did that again i just threw it out and just let it sit and just went back to fishing on shore again and i kept seeing that and then later on uh, i had my video on at the time and I looked at the video after afterwards, and I saw that uh, I was getting probably I, I only caught two that way, but I was noticing uh, about five, six other hits where I missed the missed that uh, strike. So uh, taking that lesson learned, I was like, well, what's the best way to get your get your rod down to the bottom? Well, just let it sink. And what's the best way to control it in your little kayak? Uh, it's pretty much you're using your kayak to actually fish instead of your rod so i'm just putting the rod in front of me kind of jamming it either underneath my thigh and i have my rod tip out or i have my uh i got a, like a rail blazer uh rod holder that that sits on the bow i'll put it there and uh you you'll you'll um you'll know you you've got the right uh action is when it's hit bottom and as you're back paddling, you'll just start seeing that twitchy movement of your your rod, like so. And that's that's enough to to get the strikes. And the other thing is, is before that, um, I had one of the old Water Wolf One cameras. I got a Water Wolf Two camera now, and I could probably check again if it's still the case. But with the Water Wolf One camera, I I went out several times to Lake Levon put a slab and jig rig on the end of that camera and I just tossed it out and just drug it. And I was amazed at how many different fish were chasing that slab and jig rig on the bottom. And I, I did this up at Texoma also and saw that with some of the striped bass and, and, and whatnot was one, I always thought I was, I was either snagging bottom or, or hitting rocks and whatnot, and next thing I know, I'm I'm losing a rig. Uh, when I drug that camera underwater, um, most of the times when I thought I was getting a snag, it was actually a fish popping away at the at the lure. Um, and in particular at Texoma, it's more of a rocky, bouldery uh, bottom in most areas. And then over here at Levon, when you work the uh, points and whatnot, same thing. It's got that rocky little you know bottom, uh, and and you, you, if you're using uh, a slab and jig rig, uh, you be surprised how mm, you don't break off is what I thought. Because uh, I was thinking that I'd break off a lot and snag bottom all the time if I kept bouncing bottom like that. But it turned out uh, if you set your, your rig to where I like using a, let's see, about 15 or a, what is it, a 30 pound mono as the main line for the slab and jig rig. And then I'll put some 15 or 17 pound droppers, sometimes 10 pound droppers to put the, the jigs on. And then on the bottom, I'll set like a 17 pound test where I just use a blood knot. Uh, and then that's where the uh, slab is connected and what will happen typically if the slab snags bottom is i just break off that 17 pound section off the 30 and i can quickly retie and be back in business and i still save the rest of the uh, jigs that are up the uh the, the rig uh and then uh i started using a sabiki style setup where it's the same knot that you would use when you're making a sabiki rig and what i noticed there is if i break off a jig, I can retie a dropper like under 
30 seconds easily and be back in business. Uh, and so I tend to fish more aggressively because I know I don't have to worry about breaking off because if I do, I'm only going to break off maybe uh, onesie, twosie things uh, of the jigs and I can retie quickly. Additionally, if I'm using those crappie jigs with the thin wire, those will break or not break, but straighten. I just got to bend it back in place and whatnot. And when you're, you know, you're aiming for white bass, crappie and whatnot, you know, it's not too bad. But the good thing uh, about bottom bouncing is you also get um, some nice catfish on there. Oh, unique technique. I'll try. Yeah, give it a try. Um, check out the YouTube channel, COAF Field Team, uh, and just search bottom bouncing and sabiki rig. And there should be a few videos showing that technique where I'm just showing it's, it's me back paddling watching the the rod kind of bounce and the key is you'll start seeing the rhythm of that bounce knowing that you're just kind of following the contour of the bottom and when the, when that strike happens you, you definitely will get a strike but if you do snag bottom or if something snags uh don't keep back paddling just go ahead and start paddling forward and run back over the spot and most times you it'll come free again at least that happens at Texoma and Levon, uh, where I typically fish this area. All right. Any any other questions? We we're just talking jug line fishing, kayak fishing, and then my next trip is going to be some kayak fishing, trolling slash bottom bouncing. Uh, also talked about uh, some of the Amazon demos that I've been rebroadcasting onto the YouTube channel. Especially kind of about uh, some fishing flies, um, using some of the key tools uh, that you'll be surprised. um, Some of the tools, uh, like the dubbing loop, I never used that until uh, I started making a couple flies that uh, required it. And then I also used that dubbing tool to create the collar on a mop fly. Um, Take the mop fly, which is that mop dust mop deal with a little nodule and there's a collar portion I like making and normally you kind of twist it on the thread uh, but when you use a dubbing tool you can get a nice tight wrap and it uh, makes a a fairly cool looking fishing fly that the trout bass and other things like uh, like striking Let's see, I also mentioned the whip finish tool, the nail knot tying tool. Again, that nail knot tying tool, leverage it to make that line strike indicator. A lot of times when you have uh, the case where you have trout and fish that are really wary and they don't want a strike indicator that's going to spook them, that line strike indicator makes a big difference. All right. And then let's see. Uh, Let me talk about some upcoming things that I got planned tomorrow. Doing another Amazon demo video. This one's going to be about tandem rigs. Uh, Tandem rig fishing flies. And some key takeaways there that I've discovered over the years. As well as, um, well, throwing some video, showing some past trips to show you that this technique does work. And in most times... Uh, it may make or break the uh, the day when you go out there fishing. So stay tuned for that one. That's going to be tomorrow, 8.30, I believe, on the Amazon post that I'm going to be posting. Uh, also, from a podcast standpoint, we'll be doing another set of Little Red Book of Fly Fishing, where I just go through uh, five tips at a time and just start talking or reading out of the book itself as well as then uh, just discussing some fine points of that, uh, of each tip, maybe some some nice to knows or some personal experience on how that may have worked for me. Uh, and then additionally, uh, just breaking out into any Q&A that anyone may, may uh, want to throw at us or at me. All right. And that one's going to be tips 96 through 100. So, hey, stay tuned for that one. That's always a fun one. All right. Uh Let's see. Additionally, there's a couple of, I call it the GoPro mobile fishing live stream. Uh, I've shifted it over and call it the mobile fishing live stream because of two things. Uh, I now either go either horizontal video using my GoPro connected to my phone and do a live stream in that matter. Or I may just do a mobile fishing live stream where I don't use the GoPro. I just take it straight from my Android phone and I give you that. Um, live stream and those can be good 
And those can be also painful in that uh, you, you see all the mistakes, you see all the misses, you see the non fish that happens. I mean, a lot of times I'll be striking out and whatnot and uh, pretty cool uh, when you put those together. So I've got a couple that I plan on doing with the near deer as well as the tandem rig uh, just to show you that the near deer works or just to show you that the tandem rig works in real time. And then on top of that, uh, if you're not able to see or make the uh, live stream, uh, it'll be available for you to rebroadcast as well as I make a edited version that kind of cuts down everything and either do a YouTube shorts or a edited version that just gives you the action and whatnot. How smart do you think fish have evolved over the last decade? I don't know. I just like catching them. Um, I do know that uh, sometimes it's very painful and that you'll fish a particular fish or area and it's like whatever you throw at them, they're not going to strike. And in other cases, it's like, well, maybe they forgot, but they strike everything. So I don't know. <laughs> uh, good question, though. I wonder how smart they've gotten because, you know, like uh, like my little Maltese, there's some stuff that he'll um, remember and he won't do again. Or there's other things where you'll figure out that, hey, you can you can get away the few things. So I don't know. There's There's got to be some evolution there that uh, that's come through. And made them smarter over the years. All right, let's see. Oh, and then uh, I do plan on doing my next kayak fishing trip. Yeah, I'm going to be focusing on trolling, um, doing Subic Grig, be it trolling or bottom bouncing, as I mentioned earlier. And what I'll typically do there is I'll post that video, either a long form format or a short form YouTube shorts, depending on how good or or bad the fishing was. Uh, so do stay tuned for that one. Uh, that'll be uh, coming up here, hopefully in the next week or so. Uh, okay. All right. Um, I'm hoping that's been helpful for folks. Anyone have any other questions? Let's see. Yeah, exactly. I've been spec fishing a long time now. Couldn't catch one to save my life. I'm looking forward to the kayak trips. Oh, yeah, yeah. Spec fishing's pretty fun. You're talking on the coast, uh, speckled trout. Um, I do have a affinity to saltwater fishing, especially on the Texas coast since I grew up in that area um, down south. I'm up here in North Texas currently, so do miss the water. Uh, speck fishing, especially under the the, uh, the lights, uh, really fun time with that. And additionally, uh, be it live shrimp or using some um, some croaker or other small fish for bait, it's been uh, been a blast sometimes oh yeah so uh typically it's more of a once a year twice a year run to the coast and uh this year we're aiming at uh making another run to galveston in the august time frame working to piers and whatnot and i know this last year uh i went with some sabiki rigs and fish bites and was able to get a lot of sand trout as well as the occasional speckled trout uh, working working um, Sea Wolf Park. And that was in the daytime. Uh, I didn't go at night. Uh, I went to the pier to go fish uh, other things. But, uh, yeah, uh, fun stuff on the uh, specs. Which does bring other thing to mind. I remember, I think it was two seasons back, I took the one of the bait finesse systems, ultralight bait casting gear that I have. Uh, it was a Shimano Scorpion BFS XG 17. It's got um, sealed bearings, so it's okay to take it on the coast and not really worry too much about the uh, salt corrosion, but you still have to take care of it and whatnot. Well, I took it down there and I was using some, the old H&H uh, tandem rig, spec rigs, and just had a blast there fishing for speckled trout as well as sand trout under the lights over there at the um, Galveston Fishing Pier. All right. So good stuff. All right. Um, if you have uh, any other questions and whatnot, I'll definitely um, stand by. Any comments? How's the fishing out there for some of y'all when it comes to all well, the recent uh, rains, at least for us up here? Um, anyone being able to uh, knock out a few trips in between some of the thunderstorms and rain and whatnot. 
uh, do let us know. <laughs> All right. And I think, yeah, I think that's everything. Okay. Um, so I do want to put in another plug uh, tomorrow, doing an Amazon demo. Uh, if you're not able to make it to that, I do rebroadcast it back onto the YouTube, um, just straight live or straight restream, uh, no editing. Uh, so do stay tuned for that one. And we'll be talking tandem rigs in the case of fly fishing. All right. Okay. Off for now. Next time, we'll catch y'all later. Good luck and good fishing. Mm-hmm.